Hello, my dear friends. Welcome to the show. Greg Kokel, your host. Glad to be with you. Glad you're with me. Looking forward to chatting with you today. People are lining up right now in the queue. And uh, look forward to uh, answering your calls, your, your questions, your comments, your challenges here on Stand to Reason. And uh, just got back from Bloomington, Illinois. That's where university, make that Illinois State University, is uh, not too far from my own sh- stomping grounds uh, where I grew up and um, actually went to high school. Indeed, driving back to the airport, uh, Bloomington is about two and a half hours from south of Chicago. But on the way back to O'Hare, we actually drove by my old house. Now, my old house was just right off the freeway, the house that I lived in when I was a first sophomore or make that junior and senior in high school, 1966 through 68. And we lived in a kind of a, 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 an old, uh, let's say, a remote kind of spot uh, where all the freeways crisscrossed. There was about 20 acres of land with a couple of houses in it, completely surrounded by freeways, one little road going into it. And uh, that road, from my doorstep, down that road, out of that little island, into the neighborhood adjoining to where the uh, bus stop was, was exactly one mile. So I can say to my kids that when I was in school, I used to have to walk a mile in the snow to get to the bus stop to get to school. And that was actually true. We drove by that house and I told my driver and my hosts as we were riding along, yeah, I had to walk a mile except for when my brothers and I would jump the fence and run across the um, east-west tollway, freeway. They don't call them freeways there because they're not free. We'd run across the, like, seven lanes. Yes, we did that to jump the other fence because we could actually see the bus stop from our house. But it was on the other side of the tollway, so we had to walk a mile or jump the fence, which we didn't tell our mother about, and we didn't do too often. But once in a while, <laughs> it's better than missing the bus. Anyway, uh, something happened. I had a conversation with someone there who is a professor at the local junior college that um, reinforced something that I've been saying for a long time from my own experience about the use of our tactical questions our Colombo questions, that I want to pass on to you because it's a great story, especially as it illustrates the point I often make when I'm teaching on tactics. Now, part of what I, what, what, what I want to get across when I do the training on tactics, and I think I, I'm, I'm doing that in Knoxville this weekend with Brett Kunkel. I think, well, we got a whole conference. I, my suspicion is I don't have the paper in front of me, but I'll be doing that, uh, that as well, at least a shorter version. This was a Friday night, all Saturday morning. When I lay out the game plan, which is the Colombo tactic, which is asking questions in order to maneuver in conversations and stay in the driver's seat, part of what I want to encourage people uh, with is that they don't need to know a lot in order to do this. In fact, they don't know, need to know anything, hardly except for the game plan, which is really simple. And uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk to groups, I make a promise. I say, I'm going to give you a game plan that will allow you to converse with confidence in any situation, no, ha- no matter how little you think you know, or how aggressive or articulate or knowledgeable the other person happens to be. And I think I deliver on that because the game plan is a question-asking game plan that allows you to make headway without making any claims. You don't have to be clever. You ask the questions. And anybody can ask questions. You can be in conversation with anybody. If you know the right questions, you can ask and draw them out. And they're really doing most of the work, if they're working at all. The pressure's not on you. And that's why this is such a great tool. No matter who you're talking to, whatever conversation, you could begin drawing that person out with questions, and you'll stay in the driver's seat, but there'll be no pressure on you. So that's the promise. But it gets better than that, and this is what I tell the students, is that uh, I'm not asking you to swing for the fences or even to get on base. I just want you to get in the batter's box. And when you get in the batter's box with 
the two basic questions, which are, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? What did you what do you mean by that? And there there are variations of this, of course. But you're drawing the person out, you're gathering information, you're trying to get their point of view in some detail, removing the ambiguities, trying to understand exactly what it is they do believe. So if somebody says um, everything's relative, you don't try to uh, refute that. You want them to explain what they mean by relative. Now, I know what relative means because I wrote a book called Relativism with Frank Beckwith, but I don't know that they know what it means. And I'm not trying to trap them. They're the ones who made the statement, so I just want to see what they have in mind. It could be all kinds of different things. I don't know. I want to know. And so I ask, what do you mean by that? By the way, the in the statement, everything's relative, you might also ask, what do you mean by everything? Because if everything's relative, and everything means everything, then isn't the statement, everything's relative, part of everything? Which would also make it what? Relative, too, right? So there's the... So the, why take all of that on ourselves when we can simply ask the question, what do you mean by that? Draw that person out. It's not a trick. Let them do more talking. They have the answers. Boom. And once they clarify, then we might say, if you think everything is relative in the way you just described it, why would you think that's the case? That's the second question. How did you come to that conclusion? Or some variation. Now, here is the, the payoff for my point uh, as we start this show, and this brings me to the uh, Christian I think he's a biology professor at a junior college there in Bloomington, Illinois. And the point that I make is, even though you are asking questions to gather general information about their idea and their reasons for their idea, and you are not saying anything to make a case for yourself, it is very likely that you will, in the process of just asking those questions, actually make a difference in the other person's thinking. Because what it does is it forces them to think about their own view. And the fact is, a whole lot of challenges against uh, Christians and against Christianity, and theism, and things related to that, um, seem to get purchase in discussions because of ambiguity. And, like, everything's relative. And the the Christian doesn't know how to maneuver from that point. And so, consequently, the, the challenge stands. But if we ask the question, well, what do you mean by that? We are, we are forcing the other person, in a genial fashion, a friendly way, to think more carefully about what they actually do believe. What, is, what does that mean, everything's relative, and why would anyone believe that? Chances are they never thought about that because they've been so socialized to make statements like that. They never thought about it. And when you ask the question, really, what do you mean by that? Well, then they have to think what they mean by that, and you're doing them a favor. And sometimes in the process of them thinking what they mean by that, they realize that they haven't thought about it enough. Or maybe thinking about how they come to that conclusion, maybe they realize that they haven't come to a conclusion at all, but they've just been socialized to say what they just said. And this creates a little bit of uneasiness, appropriate uneasiness, and a little bit of doubt, appropriate doubt in that case. So just by asking the question, without doing any work on your part, forcing the other person to think more carefully about what they do believe, this can make some progress. And this is why I warn people, when you ask the questions, don't be surprised when you get what I call the Simon and Garfunkel response, because of that great duo's 1960s hit, The Sounds of Silence. (laughs) Because that's what you'll get much of the time. You'll get the sounds of silence when you ask a person what he means by that or how he came to that conclusion. So back to my uh, to, to to the gentleman I met, who is the professor in biology at the junior college. We're having lunch together, and he's telling me after I finished the conference how he has been employing the tactical approach. And his since he's the professor, 
he's the one with the answers. You know, he's the man with the microphone. He's the one in charge. Um, when he when it comes to dealing with students, uh, of course, the in, the impulse is to give information. We hear the objection. We talk to an atheist, so we're going to give him information that counters his view. I understand that it's useful, can be helpful, but it's not tactically the best way to go around it. In, in fact, he encounters has encountered resistance, understandably. You make your point, the atheist makes his point, her point, and then back and forth you go. And uh, which side will win? You know, you're both defending turf. And he said, I finally just decided to um, just to ask the question instead of trying to make the case. And so one of his students, an atheist, uh, was talking with him, and the issue of, of the origin of life comes up. How do you get living stuff from dead stuff on a materialistic, with materialistic mechanisms. In other words, no intelligent design, just something like a Darwinian model. Now, there's some debate about whether Darwinism can really apply to inert matter, but nevertheless, there is a, 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 certainly a vigorous attempt to try to figure out some way that the inert matter can get itself assembled such that life happens or life is there. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. This, by the way, is a serious problem for a materialistic view of origins here. They might be able to do better with the, once you've got life, with getting to different varieties of life, but uh, I don't think so, but at least, they, at least they've got a path. But getting from non-life to life is virtually intractable for them. Now, that point could be made just the way I made it, and in the past the biologists had done it that way, but this time he simply asked the atheist for a characterization. So, you believe this life from non-life? Tell me about that. How does that work? Then he just sat back, relaxed, and listened, and here's what happened. The atheist, and I, I don't have the details of what took place. In fact, if the biologist would have told me here's the particulars of it, then I probably wouldn't have been able to follow it anyway, because it was a little more refined biological conversation. You know, you got to know the terminology and the ins and outs. But in any event, the atheist began to construct a little story about how one might get life from non-life, at least one particular avenue. And as he, as he was talking about it, laying it out, he stopped himself. And then he said, well, actually, what I'm talking about here, that's actually better evidence for intelligent design. Oh, okay, I better. I can't go there. Let, well, here's another one. How about this? And then he goes with another scenario, and as he plays out the other scenario, he then pauses and thinks about it because he's been asked, tell me how this works, and as he's trying to explain it, he realizes that this second scenario is also better explained by intelligent design rather than that by purposeless chance by material mechanisms, by event causation, as opposed to agency. There's a great little tale. And he's, the biologist is grinning at me across the table as we're eating lunch, telling me how all he did was ask the question, and that was the end of it for him. There was no more effort, no more trouble. He just listened to the other guy try to make things clear, and in the process of trying to make his own materialistic explanation of the origin of life more clear, the atheist himself realized that he was getting himself in a bind and verbally acknowledged that what he had just described is actually better evidence for my biologist friend's view which is intelligent design, which is just another example of what I was talking about to the students just that morning, that this game plan is not only easy, but if you would just make it a goal to get in the batter's box with just those first two questions, there's a third use of Columbo, but that's a little more advanced. You have to know something to employ Columbo in the third use, but not in the first two uses. I give the questions right there. You gather information with the question, what do you mean by that? You reverse the burden of proof with the question, how did you come to that conclusion? Then you sit back and see what the other guy's got. Now, maybe they've got something, and that's okay. Well, now you know. And if you can't deal with it, then you could say, well, I can't answer that. I'll have to think about it. 
And incidentally, when you say I'll have to think about it, you, you can't, not only do you let yourself off the hook, but you're, 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 you're exercising intellectual uh, integrity. Oh, that's a fair point. I'll have to give it some thought. But you are off the hook because you don't know how to answer it, and you, you just, uh, let, I'm stupid, I don't know that, so you're, you're out. So you might be just getting an education. It may be those two questions, that's all it does for you, is allow you to have friendly conversations in which you don't make your case, but you just get information about the other person's point of view. And is that valuable, by the way? Of course it's valuable. You want to know how other people think? You want to know the tough uh, questions, challenges that they have of Christians or theism or something like that? Well, let them talk. Pay attention. If it's vague, ask for clarification. What do you mean by that? Oh, that. well, that's interesting. Wait, I'm not sure. That thing you just said, that's not clear to me. Could you expand on that a little bit more? So maybe you just get a free education, which is valuable. In the process of building a relationship, interacting, I've said this before, that the closest, the closer you get to the people that you disagree with, the less frightening they become. So if you're engaging them in a conversation and you're letting them talk, Maybe you're a little frightened by about what they're going to say. Well, it's all right. Listen to what they say and then check it out on your own at your at your leisure when the pressure's off. No, no problem with that. But, but, and here's the point, really, of this little opening commentary, that e- even though you're not making your case, just asking those two questions can have a salutary impact by helping the other person see that they haven't really given this the kind of thought that they thought. (laughs) And when they look more closely at the details, um, maybe your side starts looking a little bit better to them. Hmm. Anyway, something to think about. Let's go to break quickly. Lines full up. I'll get to your calls here on Stand to Reason. Stay with us. Would you like brief, easily digestible answers to some of the challenges you face as a Christian ambassador? Well, that's why we created our Ambassador's Guide series of booklets. Each volume in this series is designed to equip you with the practical tools you need to understand a topic or area of concern confronting Christians today. With these booklets, you'll receive concise and approachable guides to various philosophies like pluralism and postmodernism, world religions such as Islam and Mormonism, even strategies on how to answer the challenges of the new atheists. To order a booklet from the Ambassador's Guide series, visit our online store at str.org or call 800-2-REASON. Greg Kokel giving you a piece of my mind today, as I do every Tuesday from 4 until 7. That's the live show, uh, broadcast various times around the country, depending on your market. Uh, usually on the weekends, on Sundays. Glad to have you all listening in. If you like to call in, though, you have to call in on Tuesday nights, Los Angeles time, from 4 p.m. until 7. Let me give you the number in case you want to do that, 855-243-9975. That's 855-243-9975. Okay, let's jump right in here, and we have a caller... um, Let's call him John. Well, no, we'll just call him Anon, because uh, thank you for calling, Anon. Welcome to the show. Hi, Greg. Thanks uh, for taking my call. Sure, glad to do it. Um, I'm anonymous today because it's kind of a sensitive topic I'm dealing with. Okay. Um, my mom has been dealing with some severe depression uh-huh. probably since this last summer, and we're Christians, and we're having a hard time finding a balance of how to, how to assess what's going on here. Uh-huh. We have some people who are friends, and they're well-meaning, and they'll say stuff like, you know what, you just need to give it to Jesus, and that'll, it'll take care of it, and he'll take care of it for you. And then, of course, we have doctors who may not acknowledge the spiritual realm at all. Mm-hmm. And we just really don't know where, I guess, where the line really yeah. is and, and how to find a balance in, in how we deal with this difficult um, disease. Sure, sure. Uh, it's a very hard situation because... The pain of depression is so real and so uh, sometimes debilitating. Uh, yeah. And, and when, when I hear people say, just give it to Jesus, I, I understand their well-meaning intentions. Um, but I have a little illustration 
that I thought of a long time ago. You know that little muscle there at the base of your neck that your mother pinches or used to pinch when you were naughty and <laughs> gets yeah. you to, to, to bend, bend into submission? Okay. What if you were just to reach across to your friend who said that and start and pinch it really hard until they, were, until they started yelping? Okay. And then you said to them, yeah. just settle down, brother, as you're pinching. Just give it to Jesus. Just give it to Jesus. Well, obviously I'm not saying this so that you make people miserable, but it's to make a point. When you're when you're deep in pain and and depression has the the, the pain is palpable. It's physical. I mean you, you it's it's deep and it's profound and it's dark and discouraging. And I'm not saying there aren't spiritual in a sense remedies or aspects of it. Mm-hmm. But for somebody to simply say, well just give it to Jesus, to me it's the same thing as Somebody, you know, you pinching that muscle, the trapezius there is what it's called. You pinching that real hard, and when they're hopping up and down, you say, just give it to Jesus, brother. Right. Um, yeah, because there's no magic in that. Giving it to Jesus does not take the pain away. And I say that as a follower of Christ for 40 years. Um, th- much of the time... Uh, Jesus, and I'm not speaking of your mom's depression or anybody in particular, but I'm just saying much of the time, the pain that we are experiencing in life, emotional or otherwise, is the very tool that God is using to work some changes in our lives that cannot be worked any other way. So now that doesn't mean we we just, okay, I'm just going to go through it and suffer it, and we are certainly free to pursue relief if we're able, if we can. And there are different things that are available. Sometimes depression is chemical. That is, there are chemical reasons why people are feeling the way they're feeling, just like there's physical reasons why you feel the pain when somebody pinches your trapezius. There are chemical things that are going on in the body that are out of whack, this is part of being uh, living in a fallen world. Uh, I'm kind of a both-and person for a lot of these things. Uh, when, I, when, when I have an upset stomach, you know, or if I'm sick, I can pray, but I can take pills too. Right. Why can't we do both? God, and probably the, the well-meaning Christians who say, give it to Jesus, uh, when you have depression, are going to be popping Pepto-Bismol when they have an upset stomach, and they're not going to think twice about that as being unspiritual. And I, one thing to kind of add, I guess, for somebody else who's calling, with the result that my mom has had from this friend, is, of course, like it's a dear friend, so very well-meaning, but um, she's now like beginning to doubt her faith a little bit, just doubt the strength of her faith, not her overall faith, and feel guilty that maybe she's not a good enough Christian. You mean your, you know, your mother is, or the person that was No, uh, my, my mom is. Uh-huh, yeah. Because, you know, she's been like, you know, if I, I have given this to Jesus, I have surrendered, I have done this, and I'm, not, I'm still feeling as uh, bad uh, as I ever have, or worse. This is, why, this is why this general approach is not only wrong, but it's often cruel. Yeah. Look at what happens when uh, people think of it in this way. Um, look at, um, Paul faced a problem in his life, and we don't know what it is for sure. He called it a thorn in his flesh, and frankly, it's probably a person that was really getting him down or getting to him, because the concept of thorn in flesh, we say flesh is your body or something. Yeah, but but we use the same phrase. Man, that guy is a you know pain in the bottom kind of thing. So we use that kind of language, but we're describing other people, and this particular phrase was popular during that time. Thorn in the flesh was usually a person. And so maybe he's got a person that's bothering him, and God doesn't take it away. He doesn't take that difficulty away. He says, look, my power is perfected in weakness. That's what he said. My power is perfected in weakness. So God can still work through the weakness, whatever that is, this debilitation that comes from the, from the, um, the difficulty you're facing. So, but that, that doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. Right. It's just what God has chosen to do. Sometimes God does deliver people. I mean, people get prayed for and things happen. And uh, they get healed, and, and the problem gets resolved. But most of the time, it is not the case. Uh, uh, there are reasons that people get depressed. It's a, it's a physiological response to things. And that response then can be, can be in a certain way, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like fossilized in your in your body chemistry. You know, it just it it creates changes that then it's hard to get back to normal. And so, um, if you if this is where medication is helpful, I don't know if it's true in everybody's case, but medication can be helpful. J.P. Moreland uh, famously. Um, wrote about his own struggle with depression, J.P. Moreland, the philosopher, one of my mentors. And I think, um, gee, what is the name of the book where you, something about the happiness triangle or something like that, uh, the enforcement? The Kingdom Triangle, there it is. The Kingdom Triangle. I think in that book of his, he talks about his own depression. And, uh, I mean, you can get depressed about being depressed, too, like your mom is getting a little bit, oh, my gosh, things are bad enough without laying the guilt trip on somebody. Right, that's how it works. Now, is there a divine perspective here? Of course there is. There was always that's kind a of divine... where I'm, I'm stuck, Greg. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get—my uh, my main question, I guess, really is that I, I don't know how to, I guess, balance my, my knowledge of both. I mean, I, I acknowledge that there are chemical things, and there probably are some instances where it's purely chemical— but she's. We've had doctors give her chemicals and fix certain things and and fix hormones and all that stuff. And then you hear some of the thoughts that she's telling you that pop into her head. Yeah. That just you know that did not come from my sweet mother's mind. They, 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 those are I would say implanted. Well, that, the way that it seems. Yeah. Well, that you know? could that could be. I'm open to that possibility, but uh, and I don't know how to assess uh, in your particular case how much is maybe overtly demonic, is what you're suggesting here. Um, that, uh, that I don't know how to assess, assess. I know that our own minds are certainly capable of a lot of nasties without very much help. So right. um, uh, let me just try to temper this word balance, it's a, because I, I don't—let's just set that word aside for a moment. Okay. I, I think we have to assess. We, we just let's just think of the circumstance, and and in any particular, let's just say it was cancer. Um, if it was cancer, there is a physical element, and there also is a spiritual element. What do you do with a, a terrible thing like cancer if you're a child of God? <laughs> Is that like a little upsetting? Is that like, well, God, what are you up to? What are you going to do with this? Are you going to heal me? Will I get over it? Am I going to die? What What's in this? Where are you in all of this? And is there opportunity for the devil to kind of find uh, get a little leverage on us in those things? Yes, absolutely. So I think all of these circumstances are complex in that regard. There are, f- there, there are physical elements, there are spiritual elements, there are emotional elements. So I try to approach it in t- as holistically in a certain sense. So if, if I—and I have experienced depression in my life, and depression has its sources— uh, there are times when I have had n- not so much medication for depression, but for anxiety. And I still I still take it on occasion uh, because I just feel overwhelmed by certain things. And so this just, it's a very, very mild medication. It just kind of takes the knife out. allows me to just relax a little bit. Do I throw myself on the Lord? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I can think of the, 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 the Psalms that I cite. Is it Psalm 65? Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. There's other psalms that talk about, uh, you know, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Trust trust in the Lord. Are you still there? Yeah, sorry, my alarm okay. went off. Okay. So trust, trust in the Lord. Just look up the phrase cast down. So there are psalms that we can go to that are meant to encourage our heart. Is there a spiritual element? Absolutely. The Lord's Prayer. You know, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Do you think I pray that? I pray that every day. I pray that almost every single day because I understand the spiritual realities that are working. It isn't like working in isolation, like all by itself, Satan's out there banging me on the head. No, all of these things are working together. And then what is God doing in all these things? He's disciplining me. Hebrews chapter 12, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, but afterwards for those who have been trained by it, yields the peaceful fruit 
of righteousness. Uh, you can also go to First Peter. Lots in First Peter, but look at how it ends. First Peter ends. He says, um, "Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you." Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, see how that's just working right it in. Anxiety and the devil. He's prowling around looking like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but resist him. So now there's an antidote there. We cast our cares on the Lord. We humble ourselves under him. We resist the devil. Firm in our faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. This is not unique. Other people are going through this too. It doesn't mean you're a lousy Christian. And after you have suffered, this is verse 10 now, suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So here in this passage, it's a great one now as I'm looking at it. I've cited it. I I know most of it just by memory because I've thought about it so much for my own life. But you can see, I never quite looked at it this way before, but you can see those elements. You have um, anxiety, you have an appeal to humility, you have an antidote, cast your cares on Jesus, you have the, the, the element of Satan looking for someone to devour, but resist him. He's in there. He's, he's fanning the flames of all of this stuff. And he's saying, this isn't unusual. Other people are experiencing it, and this too shall end. This too shall pass. God is going to use it to perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It's all right there in those, what, six verses. Right. Make that five verses, verse 6 to 10 inclusive. It's all right there. So these these things are, they're amalgams, is the way I'd look at them. They're amalgams of, of, of things and because they're an amalgam, that is, they're, uh, they're, it's, they're a couple of things all mixed together. There's a spiritual element, there's a physical thing, there's an emotional thing, there's a spiritual, in the sense of, of, of the devil kind of taking advantage of, and there's a spiritual thing that God is doing through it all, regardless of what the devil's trying to do. God can use that, regardless of the anxiety that we're experiencing. So for me, my approach when I have to struggle with these things, do I take medication? Yeah, when appropriate. Is that the cure-all, for end-all? No, it's usually not over with. It's part of a season of struggle. And I have to cast my cares upon Him because He cares for me, and I have to humble myself before Him in, pro- in, in some measure toward before other people because you can't humble yourself before God without being humble before others. Yeah. And be aware that I have an adversary. He's roaring. He's looking for someone to devour, and he can inflict damage. But I persevere. I resist him, and I persevere and let God do his work. And, and, and that's, if you want to use the word balance, that's what I think the balance is. It's all of those things. Mm-hmm. And uh, praying and trusting and doing what you can and getting out and doing a little road work. <laughs> Exercise is great. You know, that yeah. helps. Sleep, <laughs> sleep heals. That also helps getting good rest. So there's a lot of different factors here. But just because you're, anyone is struggling, you know what this proves? It proves they're a human being. That's all it proves. It doesn't prove yeah. you're unspiritual. And in fact, it, 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 it is evidence of a productive Christian to go through difficulties, anxieties, trials, and troubles. I read to you from chapter 5 and chapter 4 of 1 Peter, Peter says, why are you surprised at the fiery ordeal among you as if something strange were happening to you? Now, he's probably speaking in that verse more specifically about persecution. But these kinds of things are are not strange for the Christian. They are much more ordinary than most Christians want to admit. I don't I, I think your mom's just a human being. I know that. <laughs> yeah, who needs the grace of God, who's fighting a spiritual battle, who needs to cast her anxieties and cares around him, and, and, and probably needs some medical help at some, at some degree, if, if that's helpful. All of those things are fully legitimate. Right. That's my view. Greg, I really appreciate your thoughts, and I really appreciate the fact that I got somebody I 
I know I trust you've helped me through uh, my own spiritual doubts and apologetics in general has been a huge uh, life changer for me. Wow. So I really appreciate you being there on the radio and you know having an ear to hear and uh, knowing that I'm going to get some good advice. So, yeah, well, thank anyway. you. I, I am so glad to hear that. And, um, and look, at I too am a man. So uh, we are all humans struggling with the human condition, even though we are Christian. And this is an area where Christians have not been as maybe straightforward as they ought to have been. I, I deeply appreciate um, your call, Mr. Anonymous. Um, it, it is, it's, it, this is the human condition. I, I don't, and loving Jesus, walking with Jesus, knowing the Scripture, understanding apologetics, does not shield you from the contingencies of living in a fallen world. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. Now, he did say, be of good cheer, I've overcome this world, but that doesn't mean that the tribulation that you start to experience, Jesus jumps in and takes it away. It means that there is an overcoming in the midst of the tribulation, and the overcoming may not come to fruition until you die. I'm not saying your, all, your problems will last f- for all your natural life, but if it's not one thing, it's going to be another. That is the inheritance of the believer more than anything else. And what is, what is encouraging about these things is Romans 8, 28 and 29. We only quote that in part when we should be quoting the entire thing. Actually, verse 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He predestined to become conformed to the image of Him. His Son. That's God's commitment to us, to make us like Jesus. It isn't to give us a better job when we lose one job. Uh, it isn't to, uh, you know, my girlfriend breaks up, we're going to get a prettier one. No, we might be single the rest of our lives. His commitment is to make us like Jesus. And the best tool that he uses to do that is hardship difficulty and suffering. Do I wish it were different? Sure. (laughs) When I'm in the midst of it, but afterwards, for those who have been trained by it, yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. All right. Uh, Let's take a break and uh, back to your calls and stand to reason. You can take STR with you through our apps for iPhone, Android, and iPad, available for free from iTunes or the Android market. You can listen live to STR's weekly webcast, to podcast archives by all of our STR speakers, check the STR blog, and access timely and practical resources on many subjects, including the latest Solid Ground, Greg's mentoring letters, and much, much more. You'll have STR resources at your fingertips in a clean layout with great features and functionality. It's free, so download the app today through iTunes or the Android market and start carrying STR with you everywhere you take your phone. Just one more way that STR is seeking to increase your knowledge, wisdom, and character. The show that turns your mind on, ladies and gentlemen, makes your brain grow. Those are two different things. I, I didn't know that second thing until I read it in a paper somewhere. Some scientific study shows that when you think harder, your brain actually grows. That's good. That's good. So um, that's uh, we can do that here on Stand to Reason. Let's uh, talk to uh, Dusty in Tucson. Hello, Dusty. Dust- Greg? Dusty, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. Um, I just, first of all, wanted to say thank you very much uh, to all of you. As Stand a Reason, I had my first conversation with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses this uh-huh. weekend, uh-huh. and I totally felt, um, you know, prepared and confident, and I think that put me at ease to where uh-huh. this wasn't an aggressive conversation. It ended uh, very friendly. 
Um, and and uh, it was even cool because at the end they said that I was the first person uh, in 10 months that they've talked to that was prepared to discuss these topics, which oh, my shocked me. Goodness. But at the same time, it made me think, wow, how how lucky am I to have these resources like huh. Tactics and Never Read a Bible Verse and, yeah. uh, you know, the materials like the podcast. But uh-huh. also, you know, shocked me because these are, these are people walking around in my neighborhood. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. So you're the first one of all the people that, yeah, you, you, it's like, in a way, well, that's a little bit months. bad news, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of bad news, but no, that's just in 10 months, so yeah, uh, maybe they will only talk to five people. Or oh, something. okay. Listen, I was in Tucson, I think, in the fall. Were you at the event that I was at, Dusty? You know what? I wasn't, Greg, and uh, I was catching up on your podcast, so I didn't hear uh-huh. until, I think you were in there October or something, and it was over in Vail, and I about lost my mind because I thought, how was I not checking oh, the calendar? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but we'll have. I'm hoping that the the lady from uh, last uh, two podcasts ago brings you out to Mesa, and then I'll go there. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. That'll be great. And I, I think we've uh, we've kind of haven't been doing our email blasts lately because uh, we're just kind of doing technical stuff on the website and all that. And we've got a lot of other things to do, but eventually we'll get back to that. So when we're within striking distance, then you'll get an email from us just letting you know that we're in town. Otherwise, okay. look at the schedule. That's that's what I'd suggest people do. Just go to our website, punch my picture, and look for my schedule, and you'll find uh, where I'm going to be at any given time, any of the other speakers as well. So that would yeah. be my suggestion. Yeah, unfortunately, I did that after uh, <laughs> Too after late. you were already gone. But no, I, I I've been doing that lately. So thank okay. you for for all the the information. You're welcome. Um, so my question is, uh, I was I was going through the arguments. You know, they they said, hey, we'd like to talk to you. And I saw a watchtower, and I said, oh, so you're Jehovah's Witnesses? And they said, yeah. And I said, okay, great. Um, you know, I. Thank you, but no thank you. You know, we differ uh, theologically. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that Jesus is God. Do you mm-hmm. believe Jesus is God? And, and we kind of went through this process and, you know, went to John 1, um, 1, 1, and 1, 2, and 1, 3, and then, yeah. uh, you know, just kind of danced around there. But I, I asked them if, uh, you know, I said, here's the thing, uh, Jesus, you know, we can look at the Greek right now, but we're 2,000, you know, roughly 2,000 years removed. Right. The The people at that time knew exactly what he meant when he blasphemed, uh, according to them, and they killed him for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, you believe he's human? And they said, yeah. And I said, you believe that um, that men are fallen, that, you know, we're fallen, the fallen nature? And they said, yes. And I said, how is it that Jesus was sinless, and yet he was only a man? Mm-hmm. And so I was just wondering, is that a good argument, the, the sinless nature of Jesus, a good case for his divine nature? Well, uh, let me make another comment first. I'm trying to remember, since I'm not really a student of the cults, theologically, I don't think that Jehovah's Witnesses or the doctrine of that organization teaches that Jesus was exactly a man. He wasn't just like everybody else. I think he was the incarnation of Michael the Archangel, and I think their biblical anthropology is different than ours. So that's just for the record. You, you can check, okay. uh, check it out. Their understanding of the doctrine of man mm-hmm. is different. At least the, the, their doctrine of the humanity of Christ is different than ours. In our doctrine, Jesus was a full and complete man. Everything that was essential to humanity was found in the person of Jesus. Fallenness was not essential to humanity. Adam wasn't fallen. He was a man. Um, so Jesus doesn't have to be like us in that way in order to be a true human. But you're specific. So you just make a note of that, and you might want to check that out sometime if you're going to pursue this more theologically. What is their understanding of the human nature? And you're going to have to go of, of Jesus, and you're going to have to go to some more authoritative source than the guy who knocks on the door, probably. Yeah. But with regards to is Jesus' sinless nature a good reason to believe his divinity? Um, well, certainly, if Jesus was divine, he would be sinless. However, is it possible to be non-divine and sinless? And I think, yes, that's the case. Adam was that way until the fall. So one could say all the way up until the fall, he was sinless like Jesus. Um, There is a debate whether Jesus is capable of sinning or not. And um, 
my opinion that he's not capable of sinning, but because he's God and God can't sin. But there's a, there's the other side as well. So, but be that as it may, it seems clear that there was a human that for a season was without sin, though he wasn't divine. And at least in my view, when we when we're in a resurrected body, we will also be without sin. That is, we will not have a sin nature, and we will not actually sin. In fact, I think we'll be incapable of sinning. I certainly hope so. Uh, so I, I, the question is, is sinlessness evidence of divinity? And the, I, the answer I would say is no, if you think that only God could be sinless, and therefore if he's sinless, that means he is God. Um, I think it's more of a negative test. Uh, not a positive test. That is, if he is sinless, well, then he could be God, but he could be a man too, and not God. But if he's a sinner, then he's certainly not God. So I, I, I would rather trade personally on other lines of argument. The direct, it's some that you use. The direct statements of Scripture, where it says Jesus is. Our God and Savior Jesus Christ, for example, right. in Titus. And there's a lot of verses like that. Or verses that identify uh, certain qualities as unique to, shall we say, Jehovah God. And Isaiah 45 has a bunch of those characteristics, like there is one Savior, only one. Uh, there is one Creator, only one. There is one Alpha and Omega, only one, that kind of thing. And then those same words are used to describe Jesus in the New Testament. So it seems like Jesus is the Jehovah God of the Old Testament in virtue of that line of argument. That, I think, is a good one, too. There are lots of those verses, by the way. And, uh, and then finally, the, the identification of Jesus as the uncreated creator in John 1, verse 3, which you said you talked to them about a little bit, too. Those, I think, are more will be more powerful um, testaments to uh, the divinity of Christ, than that he was sinless. At least yeah, that, that's I, I mean, I, I was just you. the reason why I brought that up is because I I kept bringing it back to you know First John, I mean um, John chapter one, mm-hmm. um, and even and where never read a Bible verse came in handy is when they tried to say, well, okay, we'll look at Colossians one fifteen. Uh, they and I do said, that well, all let the me time. read before and after, and I said, well, the verse right after looks like uh, you know John three, uh, John one three. Yes, uh huh. And so um, I kept going back there, but, you know, and I did two things after the conversation. One, um, you know, I wrote down my kind of argument so I could uh-huh. kind of think about it later. And then two, I listened to Trinity, uh, the Trinity um, uh, Solution, Not a Problem. Right, yeah, and, the standard reason CDA uh, taught. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I, it gave me a lot of good ideas, but I, I felt if they could have gotten me anywhere, it would have been there. So I thought, you know, why not ask you if, if it would be a, you know, it, I, so... Uh, basically, from your response, I'll throw that one out. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I don't think that's as good as the other ones, but it sounds right. to me like you're pretty well re- re- well prepared. Um, here's one: the only other advice that I'd offer, and I, I'm not clever with speaking with people like that, but I, I do know that there are, there are, in a certain sense, two ways to approach this. There is the, well, let's just call it the objective or and the subject, or let's say the evidential and the existential. That's a that's a little bit more sophisticated way of putting it. So we can go a to, to them with the evidence and, and explain this and try to show the Scripture uh, that, that supports the biblical view of uh, the God-man Jesus, the, the, the work and the, the person and the work of Christ. And I think that's fabulous and really important and necessary. But sometimes there is... You can kind of, you can also take a shot at the heart in 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 a in a way of speaking. That is, you can talk specifically to the existential reality that every human being is experiencing, and that is their awareness of their own shortcomings, their own fallenness, their own um, inability to to sustain God's requirements. And boy, the Jehovah's Witnesses of all people, would be aware of that because so many demands are made upon them, legalistic-type demands. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if many of them are not struggling under a burden of guilt. And so to be able to make your case for Jesus the God-man from the Scriptures really key. 
but then to be able to communicate, and this is the man that died for you. This is the man who gave his life for you, so you could be forgiven. And that's perfect mercy. That is forgiveness for everything that you have ever done, and God misses nothing. Do you ever hunger for forgiveness? Jesus offers real forgiveness because he was the God-man who suffered for you. So now you, you see my, my appeal here is a little different, isn't it, Dusty? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's kind of, and even as I'm talking, I'm like softening my tone a little bit, not to be manipulative, but to, to speak appropriately to this person in this situation. I remember when I, I, spoke, I, I um, taught at Berkeley, or I lectured at Berkeley uh, a number of years ago, and I, um, I talked about, why, uh, about relativism. This was the first talk I gave. And uh, I tried to show that relativism, moral relativism, is false, therefore some form of moral objectivism is true. That is, that there are objective moral principles out there, and uh, that, that's, it, but the bad news, of course, is that we, we break them. And this helps explain something about the human condition. And I, I talked about guilt, how we all feel guilty. And I said, why do we all feel guilty? Well, maybe we feel guilty because we are guilty. <laughs> okay, is that, is that a possibility? That's what I said to them. And, and I think that was a, that was a, a powerful moment, moment, maybe the most powerful moment of the evening, more powerful than my arguments against relativism and for objectivism. Now we're just talking about what they know they experience. And I tell them, and then I told them that, that, that here's how I cashed it out. I said, the answer to guilt um, is not denial. That's relativism. That's, what, that's denial. The answer to guilt is forgiveness. And this, I said, is where Jesus comes in. And I think that when I said the answer to guilt is forgiveness, and whenever I say that to whoever I'm listening to right now, who's listening to me right now, I feel... I, 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 I just have a sense that that's almost like water on a thirsty soul. So sometimes when you're talking to people, you're giving the evidence, you're giving the objective stuff. Um, other times you're giving the subjective stuff, you're speaking to this existential situation. You're, you're giving water to a thirsty person, not just answers to an inquisitive mind. And, um, and both have their place. And so um, sometimes... When you're talking to somebody like a Jehovah's Witness, that's, or LDS, Mormon, uh, or anybody for that matter, regardless of their spiritual convictions, the, this, the, mixing this kind of thing in with your communication is, I think, powerful. Th listen, think of Jesus' words. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, th that, I think, has existential appeal. What do you think? No, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, you, you just might think about that next time you talk with your friends there. No, I think it's a great point. I definitely will. Okay, good. Nice Thank talking you to you, Dusty. Much, I hope to see you next time I come in your neck of the woods. Me too. Take care. All right, bye-bye. So that's the evidential and the existential, the objective and the subjective. And, and uh, I know some of you might be thinking, gee, honey, where did he come up with that? I thought he was like Mr. Left Brain, and this sounds a little bit on the right side of the brain. It's all part of the picture, friends. And uh, our best kind of appeal incorporates all of that. I have been concerned when people are too much on the, the right side, as it were, totally into the subjective. I think we could do better than that, and, and sometimes we get so subjective we almost get silly uh, in the way we talk about God and the gospel and things like that. But at the same time, um, there is a place for that, and Jesus appealed to the heart, not just to the mind. Um, he appealed to both, and uh, this is where, like I said, his, his comment, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, incidentally, I'm still trying to figure out that last one because it doesn't feel like that um, all the time. And this takes us back to our earlier caller and depression and things. It just doesn't feel like the yoke we carry with Jesus, the burden we carry, is easy or light. Uh, but we carry it with him, and part of our task is to figure out how all of that works and to stay in stride with him as he helps us. Isn't that right? And we can offer that to other people. We can offer them the 
the, the answer to their existential yearnings, the deep yearnings of their heart, Jesus of Nazareth. All right, friends, thank you for spending time with me this hour. I've got a couple hours ahead of me, so you stay with us. Coming up, by the way, our final hour, Justin Taylor, JT of, uh, of Between Two Worlds blog, and he's got a new book out called, called The Last, or rather, The Final Days of Jesus, The Most Important Week of the Most Important Person Who Ever Lived. We'll cover that our last hour together here on Stand to Reason.